All right, welcome folks. Uh, this is the webinar for Discover the Universe on Solar Eclipses. And just before we get started, I wanted to introduce myself and then I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourselves through our chat feature. Um, you're not gonna be able to unmute your microphones or anything like that because we are recording and we want it to be a streamlined uh, recording for those who aren't able to join us right now at this moment. But I'm Charles Woodford, most people call me CJ. I am an education content developer with Discover the Universe and I've been working with DU on our Eclipse project and doing a lot of work for and on solar eclipses uh, to bring you some educational content as well as kids. So I'm really excited to talk to you about solar eclipses and especially what you're going to see on June 10th. But I'd like to hear from y'all about where you're from, if you teaching big classes, if you're doing virtual teaching with your students right now, if you're you know someone who's just really, really jazzed about solar eclipses, um, I'd love to know about that too. I see that there's some people from Toronto, from New Brunswick, um, from Montreal. So there's people from all across Canada here, BC and Kelowna, very nice. All right, and if you don't want to do yourself as well, that's also totally, totally fine. Um, so why don't we get started? Please feel free to continue introducing yourselves as people join the chat. We are really interested to know uh, where you're calling in from and your background. So as I mentioned, I'm CJ and I'm gonna be talking to you about solar eclipses. If you're not here for solar eclipses, that's kind of too bad, you're here now and I'm gonna entice you to stay and learn about these really rad astronomical events. So just before we get started, of course, if you're not familiar with Discover the Universe, maybe this is your first webinar. Uh, maybe you just signed up because a friend of yours or a colleague shared the webinar link to you. We are a group that is, our whole goal is to help teachers and educators by providing educational resources and training in astronomy and sometimes also branching into physics. Um, all the stuff we do is free. Most of it is online. And our goal here is to support you in whatever your education needs are in astronomy also want to highlight that there are training modules up. So again, if someone just sent you the link for this webinar, amazing, glad you're here. Uh, but if you want to know more about future training as well as um, specific workshop for informal educators on June 7th through 25th, I have both of those links up on the screen. And just so you know that we've already mentioned the um, webinar is being recorded. So you're going to have access to that afterwards. As well, these slides are all uh, available on Google. So on Google Drive, we have them available as a Google um, presentation. And I encourage you to go check that out. You're able to comment on it directly, which is awesome. I'm going to ask for questions during the webinar, get put through Zoom, but you can always leave comments after the webinar. You think about something that you're not sure of, put it in the Google, in the Google presentation. I'm happy to respond to that um, afterwards. Uh, that's going to be great, honestly. We're also trying out this new feature of Google presentations. So please, by all means, let us know how you find it. Let us know if it's if there's any issues with it. We want to make sure we're providing you the best possible education content in the best possible means. Um, so have a look at those slides. You can download them as other formats, such as PowerPoint or ODTs, and or, and, or you can put them right into a copy on your own Google Drive and use in Google Classroom. So that's kind of the preamble there. So let's dive right into solar eclipses. That's what we're here to talk about. So I think the very first question, and maybe a lot of you already know the answer, what is an eclipse? Let's, not, let's just leave the solar part out of it for right now. What is an eclipse in and of itself, regardless of the type? So there are two different kinds of eclipses that we can see, and we're gonna get into more specific details in a, in a few minutes. But one of the ones that we can talk about that helps us contextualize what we mean by eclipse is a lunar eclipse. So a lunar eclipse, lunar, lunar meaning moon, and eclipse usually means eclipse by or casting a shadow. So a lunar eclipse is an eclipse of the moon and the Earth's shadow falls on the moon. So this means that when we look at the moon, the Earth's shadow is going to cover it. And this is a familiar photo of what a lunar eclipse can look like. We've, we sometimes call them harvest moons or strawberry moons. Um, blood moons, you might have heard a different different words for them, but essentially the moon turns a little darker, turns a little redder. You can also, of course, have a solar eclipse. That's the whole name of the game. Um, solar eclipses, conversely to lunar eclipses, solar means sun, so it's an eclipse of the sun, and in this case the moon's shadow falls directly onto earth. 
So this means that as people on Earth, as observers on Earth, we look at the sun and the moon is passing in front of it. So this is an example of what a solar eclipse would look like. So let's talk about the lunar part first. Let's talk a little bit about lunar eclipses. So when we think about the orbit of the moon, we have Earth and the moon goes around. I'm going to close the chat window. And as the Earth, as the moon goes around the Earth, we have phases of the moon. Now, if you don't remember them off, no, don't remember them all off by heart. That's totally, totally fine. But the general idea is that we have our sun all the way over here. And as the moon orbits, ar orbits around the Earth, we go through different phases. So that means that the sun is illuminating different parts of the moon, and they appear to be different shapes for observers on Earth like us. So the ones that you're probably most familiar with would be new moon, when we can't see the moon at all, full moon, when we see the full moon. It's pretty, yeah, full moon is full moon. <laughs> and then you might also be familiar with first quarter as well as last quarter. But a question I'm going to pose to you to think about right now is, are full and new moon, the fa those phases of the moon, is the full moon phase and the new moon phase, are they eclipses? I'm just going to think about it for a few seconds. And a visual to help you think about it. But the answer is no. Not all, no, they're not, they're not eclipses. Um, so this is actually because an, a lunar eclipse or an eclipse at all is kind of hard to come by. They need to have just the right positioning or just the right alignment of the earth, moon and sun system. And the moon's orbit is not completely aligned with the earth's orbit around the sun. So just because the moon is passing in front of the earth does not necessarily mean it's passing directly between the earth and the sun. So we call this slight tilt to the moon's orbit and inclination, and it's a five degree inclination. And this five degrees, even though that kind of sounds small, is a big deal in the way that that alignment is tricky to have for the moon and the earth and the sun to be completely aligned to create either a lunar or a solar eclipse. But that being said, eclipses are not necessarily rare. Uh, they do happen about twice a year, once every six months. So Another thing to think about is that if we're saying an eclipse happens approximately every six months, how often does a lunar phase happen? How often do we see a full moon or a new moon? And I'm going to remind you that the um, lunar orbital cycle is about 28 days. So we see one of these phases every 28 days, and that's a lot more frequent than twice a year. So either way you look at it, whether you think about it in terms of how fast does the moon move around Earth or the fact that it's really hard for these three bodies to align just right to create any kind of eclipse. Uh, full moon and new moon are not eclipses, but they are cool, very cool phases of the moon. What we want to point out, though, is that this is kind of the season of eclipses, uh, not just this year, but also in the next few years, especially as we lead up to 2024, which you may or may not heard. We have a pretty rad total eclipse that's going to be passing right over right over um, Canada or parts of Canada. But I do want to point out there's going to be two eclipses that are happening uh, in very short succession. One of them's on May 26. There's a May 26 lunar eclipse and a June 10th um, a solar eclipse. And the June 10 solar eclipse is the one we're really going to focus on today. But I will point out that these two pieces on the slides are links. So again, if you want to go check out those Google slides, uh, you will be able to click on those links and follow them to the pages that we're highlighting here to learn more about these eclipses respectively. So thinking about a lunar eclipse again. A lunar eclipse is when we have alignment of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. And in this case, it's when the Earth is between the Sun and the Moon. So the Earth is going to cast a shadow on the Moon. Now, I will say that the reason why, even though Earth is casting its shadow on the Moon, the Moon doesn't just disappear during a lunar eclipse is because of the Earth's atmosphere. So this is why lunar eclipses um, don't have the Moon just disappearing. It turns kind of red. That is because of light that comes from the sun, passes through the Earth's atmosphere, and is refracted 
So refraction is um, like passing through a medium, in this case, passing through the atmosphere, and it will refract onto the moon. Also why it turns red because of that refraction. So lunar eclipses, even though the moon doesn't disappear, it is still in the shadow or the umbra of the earth. And so just repeating that real fast, when the moon is completely um, in the Earth's shadow, it'll appear dark red. And that is largely because, or 100%, because even though it's in the Earth's shadow, uh, the light refracted from the Earth's atmosphere is refracting onto the moon. And a fun fact about this is that when we think of other planets with moons, um, like say Mars, if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere at all, the moon would disappear during a lunar eclipse. So, you know, not a fun idea to think about if the Earth loses its atmosphere, um, but if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere and a lunar eclipse occurred, the moon would be completely invisible. It'd be completely blocked out because it was in the Earth's shadow and there's no refraction from, it, from the atmosphere, it's not there. So if we were to see a lunar eclipse, um, say for example, on Mars, don't really have any real data about this yet, but hopefully soon, uh, you would expect a lunar eclipse on Mars, which has a very, 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 very thin atmosphere to essentially have those moons be completely eclipsed or, or disappear during a lunar eclipse. So that's something fun to think about. It is completely because of the Earth's atmosphere that the moon doesn't, does, doesn't disappear and the fact that it turns red. I also forecast that to be a question from your students. Why doesn't the moon disappear during a lunar eclipse? Why is the moon red? Switching our gears into solar eclipses, it, this is when we have, again, an alignment of the sun and the moon and the earth. But this time, instead of the earth blocking light to the moon, the moon is blocking light to the earth. Because of their respective sizes, the moon doesn't block out all the light that hits earth. It just casts a shadow on the earth, the earth being much bigger, of course. So solar eclipses occur when the moon is placed between the earth and the sun. This is normally what we would call new moon, but when it hits that alignment just right, it's not necessarily a new moon anymore, it's a solar eclipse. This is a drawing of how the shadows actually fall. And in this case, what we have here is a location of a partial solar eclipse, as well as the total solar, a total solar eclipse. So this part where the partial would show up or where the shadow isn't very dark, where the shadow isn't very dark, not all of the sun's rays are blocked in this region, that's called the penumbra, or sometimes called the shadow gradient. And in the region where it is very, very dark or the light is completely blocked out, we call that the umbra or the dark part of a shadow. Now, these words are not only used for eclipses. The penumbra and the umbra are real terms used for shadows of any kind. Um, so we have links on that as well in these slides if you want to learn more about shadows and playing with light, or maybe you have a high school optics class that would like to play around with learning about different types of shadows. So I really encourage you to dig into that um, if you think you might have students or folks that would be interested in learning about it. But the take home here is that the penumbra is the shadow gradient, not as much light is blocked out, and the umbra is the dark shadow. And that's where more or all of the light is blocked out. And that's where we would call the path of totality in the case of a solar eclipse or where most or all of the light is blocked. So just to emphasize why this is so difficult, not only does, the, does it need to be quite in alignment, the scale here, you might've noticed at the bottom of all of our previous images, the scale, it always said illustration, not the scale. This one is to scale. So the sun is somewhere way over on the edge of the screen, <laughs> can't even put it on the picture because it's so big. And then in terms of not just the size of the moon and the earth respectively to one another, but also how far away the moon is from the earth. I hope this gives, us, gives you a better idea um, now that we're showing it to scale of why this is so tricky, why not every new moon passes right in front of the, um, right in between the earth and the sun and why it's tricky to get these three celestial bodies to line up just right to give us either eclipse type. If you haven't um, been looking at eclipses or you're looking for some resources to show what previous eclipses looked like, I would like to point out um, one of the ones that was taken by the Discover Epic satellite. And this was of the eclipse that happened in August of 2017. I'll link there on the slide for you as well. And this is a, um, a simulation and some observations, as well as just pointing out that this dark point right up here 
at the top of the um, image of the Earth is the shadow of the moon. So very, very similar to our illustration before. And this is what an eclipse looks like when you're seeing it from Earth, or sorry, seeing it from space. So let's keep talking about a solar eclipse. Solar eclipses also have their own phases, the same way that the moon has phases. So as a solar eclipse is occurring, the first thing you'll see is that the disk of the sun is starting to get crossed out by the moon. So this is where the moon is starting to pass over the sun. The moon continues to move in front of the sun, blocking out more and more light until it blocks out all of the light. What we're seeing in this particular image is the sun's atmosphere, the corona. So all of the sun itself is blocked out, but it's wispy bits on the outside are what we're viewing in this particular image. And then as the moon keeps moving, the sun comes back into view and it is super, super bright. So then it, it overpowers this particular photo. So those are kind of the phases that happen as a solar eclipse occurs. The moon's gonna start passing in front. We have a partial eclipse. It'll actually get to block out all of the sun's rays um, from the sun itself. That's our total with the corona or the atmosphere being visible. And then as the moon keeps moving, the sun peaks out. So this is when we would move into how can we model eclipses, but I'm gonna take a, just a moment here to see if we have any questions already in the chat. Um, I might have to scroll a little bit. Okay, no, I see one question from David. Uh, is refracting the correct description? I thought the Earth's atmosphere causes dispersion of the sun's light, particularly the blue, leaving the red portion to illuminate the moon. So this is a really good point. And I will say that I was not necessarily planning on getting into the nitty gritty details of the geometric optics that happen with the Earth's atmosphere. But I will say that the atmosphere does do more than one thing. Refraction happens regardless. Anytime that light rays pass through a transparent medium and the atmosphere is mostly transparent. So refraction is indeed what happens during a lunar eclipse, but I, you're definitely right. There is also a dispersion happening in the atmosphere. Um, so I think for the purposes of say, explaining why the moon is still illuminated during a lunar eclipse, refraction is a complete enough answer, but dispersion of light rays as they interact with particles in the atmosphere is a little bit, is uh, the more correct description. You're absolutely right. Oh, and Julie's just making sure that everyone's able to access the slides from the Google slide link. So again, for, and actually, you know what? This is actually a good, a good explanation. I don't know if it's a good use of our time during the webinar to get into optics of the atmosphere, but I would really recommend that if I'm not answering your questions to the level that you're happy with, or you have continuing questions, you have follow-up questions, um, and you wanna get into a little bit more of a discussion on it, please do comment them on the slides themselves. I'm more than happy to follow up with that later and put in more resources and have more of a discussion. So totally welcome. All right, so let's move on. So I didn't see any other questions for the first part about, about what a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse are, as well as how they happen or why they happen and why they're difficult and why that's rather um, tricky for the alignment to work. We can talk about now, how do we model eclipses? Because again, this is a webinar intended for how do we talk and educate folks on eclipses? So it's twofold. We're learning and we're teaching. So one of the one of the ways that can be low cost, something you might already have in your classrooms or at home or easy to, to get would be to model with balls and or balloons, again, depending on what you have. So this could look like, again, if you wanna, if you wanna shell out for a really fancy earth, um, like beach ball, get something custom printed, I think that's super fun, but not necessary uh, to enjoy this particular um, activity. So this is indeed a simple model, it's not to scale, but what it can do is allow an understanding of shadows, the positions of the earth, moon and the sun. So low cost, effective, you don't have to worry about small parts getting uh, swallowed and choked on or anything like that. So this is a good one for young children and young classes um, or something where you might need to have a lot of kits or a lot of demonstrations happening at the same time because it is low cost. So you'd wanna have a big one for the earth or a terrestrial globe or a beach ball you'd wanna have a small balloon or a small ball for the moon. And even if you don't wanna do um, balloons, if there's tennis balls, you could use a tennis ball and then a larger ball for the earth. 
you ideally to avoid needing to create an uh, artificial light source, you want to do it outside with the real sun. So preferably on a nice day. Um, hopefully it's a nice day where you are. It's a nice day where I am. And if you're indoors, um, if it's not a nice day, make sure that the sunlight from windows is blocked out and that you're using an artificial source so that you're getting the correct um, you're getting the correct positioning of the shadows. You don't want light sources for multiple, you don't want multiple light sources rather, uh, because then the light rays are gonna get mixed up and it's gonna be harder to create an accurate shadow using this particular setup. So this is a low cost one that's probably good for all ages, especially young children. And some questions that you could ask while doing this, and again, depending on the level of your students or the level of the group that you're, that you're working with, um, you might want to ask different questions in different ways and have different follow-up, but some of the ones we thought would be helpful is what if the moon, earth, and sun are aligned? So that's, you know, maybe the first to do for the kids. What happens when they're aligned? Are they able to recreate a lunar eclipse? Are they able to recreate a solar eclipse? How difficult is each one? That might be an important one too. Is one easier than the other would be a good, good follow-up one from that. Does the moon's shadow cover all of the earth? Does the earth's shadow cover all of the moon? From our previous images, we, we might already know the answer to these, but I think these are really good um, exercises to go through physically uh, for kids and for students. Does the moon move around the earth? And how does this affect the position of the moon's shadow? So this would be something visceral. And I'm gonna take out my own little eclipse kit, which I'll demonstrate later. But the idea for this one is that they could demonstrate how the moon moves. And I don't have a great light source right now, but the idea <laughs> would be you try and cast a shadow and then be like, it has the moon moves, how does the shadow change? Um, or does it not change? That would be the other, the other part of that question. And then during the eclipse, what would the inhabitants of Earth see? So this is back to this point of eclipses are great, but really what we're talking about is how do we as observers on Earth view the eclipse or the partial eclipse or the phenomenon that's happening. So this is when we now have our scale model and I've already shown this a little bit. Uh, the scale model, the benefits are that it allows not only understanding of the shadows and the positions, but it also gives you more of an understanding or your students more of an understanding of the scale and why it's trickier, um, why it's a little difficult for this alignment to happen and why it's rare that it doesn't happen very often or all or every time we have a new lunar cycle. So I've already held up two of the pieces that are from this, but the idea is that you have um, two little, two balls, one, the big one's the earth and the little one's the moon. And uh, Julie figured out that the little ball that is for the moon is actually better off as a styrofoam ball. So from a craft store, they stick on the end of the stick better. Um, you would take these two and you would put them onto a one meter ruler. So I have one here but this could be any ruler you have, say in a classroom, um, what have you, you would then connect, you would connect them on. So tape is what's shown in the image here, or you could use clamps uh, such as these clips here. I dropped my, I dropped my earth, it's fine. Such as these clips, you would use these to clip them on. And then you would be able to move your, um, your apparatus to try, hopefully with the sun outside, hopefully you're doing this outside. The, you would try and cast shadows on little moon and the earth, respectively. So just to go over again, what's actually included here, I have a, I already have a kit, but if you were to make your own of this, it's pretty easy. You'd need something that's about 2.5 centimeters for the earth, something that's about 0.7 centimeters for the styrofoam ball. Um, scale up or down is needed. I think scaling down would be hard, so scale up is needed. Um, you'd need two paper clips or clamps or tape to put your earth and moon onto the onto your ruler stick. You then of course need a one meter ruler stick and tape is always just a really great backup to have. Uh, in this case, they taped them on to the stick. So the difficulty with scaling is that when on the ruler stick with these exact sizes of the balls that we've said here, if you place them 75 meters apart, it'll give you a two scale model of the earth moon system. So if you're scaling up, you're also going to have to scale up the distance between the earth and the moon. And that is probably going to get, that's probably going to get larger than one meter really, really quickly. So again, this slide, if you're going to make it yourself, uh, please do follow the numbers on here if you want it to be truly to scale. 
And as I was mentioning about the method, you would, once you have everything on your ruler stick and you've got the right balls in the right places, um, hold the ruler at, towards the sun, so in line with the sun. And you want to see how you can align the Earth and the Moon to create eclipses. Uh, the Earth closer to the sun if you want to try and create a lunar eclipse, and the Moon closer to the sun if you want to try and recreate a solar eclipse. Now, this is hard. <laughs> Um, you want to be careful not to create a shadow with your hands and you don't, and you want to um, move the ball. You want to have the balls high enough off, off the ruler so that the ruler is not casting a shadow. And so there's a bunch of things to keep in mind here, as well as the fact that the alignment is just hard to accomplish. Um, the same reason why it's not all the time that we have solar and lunar eclipses that are visible on Earth is the same reason why this activity is a little tricky and it might be better suited to slightly older students. Um, say grade six and up or 12 and up might be a good, a good place to start, but up to you, you know your students best. Um, so because the alignment is quite difficult, it takes some fine motor skills. Uh, one way that you can do it or you can suggest for your students to try it is to align the shadows on the ground. So the idea is you would be holding your meter stick and my meter stick doesn't have uh, a moon and earth on it just yet, but you'd hold your meter stick. And then as your light source is coming in, I would look down at the ground and I would move my meter stick around in whatever directions are necessary to try and get the shadow of my earth ball and my moon ball to align on the ground or on the floor um, under underneath the ruler. So that would be the goal and that would be the kind of the, the trick there to get that to work. And so what you can expect to see is the shadow of the moon being um, projected onto the earth if you're showing a solar eclipse. And so really showing it, this is a 2.5 centimeter wide ball. And that's the size of the shadow. If you think back to the projection um, or the image of the 2017 solar eclipse that was shown by a satellite, you'll, you might, look at those comparisons and say, wow, that shadow is actually quite accurate. Again, our two scale model is doing its job, it's to scale. But it is also a very small shadow on a very small ball, hence the difficulty with doing this particular one. It takes some fine motor skills, as I mentioned. If you wanna do a lunar eclipse, you just wanna make sure that you're highlighting the difference between an illuminated moon, which would be a full moon in this case, and an eclipsed moon, which is your lunar eclipse. So in the same positioning of the earth being between the moon and the sun, you can either have your full moon or your lunar eclipse. And this would be a good um, exercise to showcase those differences, how the shadow of the earth falling on the moon is what creates that lunar eclipse. And so as I've been hinting at, there is indeed a model you can buy of this if you don't wanna make it yourself uh, and you have the funds to do so. And so this kit, does indeed come with the earth, it comes with the little moon, it comes with the clamps to hold them on, and it comes with a collapsible ruler. And it's even, um, it's even branded, <laughs> which, is, which is nifty too. And so this is from the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And if you have the means to do so to get this kit, it's really, really small, it's easy to store, and it does hit all of those learning goals in terms of the earth, moon, sun system, how do shadows work, it hits the, it hits the um, scale model of the Earth and Sun system, as well as solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. Um, so this is a great one to either make yourself or as highlighted on this particular slide to purchase, which is fun. All right, so now that we've talked about what is an eclipse, the differences between solar eclipses and, lun and uh, lunar eclipses, as well as how you would showcase and make some activities or either create or purchasing activities and kits to share with your students or share with the folks that you're um, talking about eclipses with. Now we can actually get into what will we see on June 10th? Why did we make this webinar um, now <laughs> and not say three months down the road or three months previously? And it's because there's a big event happening on June 10th. So before, actually before we go, I accidentally hit my own uh, slide there. I'm gonna check the chat again to see if we have questions. All right, looks like there's questions about the link for the slides, link for the kit, 
Perfect. All right. So if everyone has everything they need from what we've talked about previously, access to the slides, access to the links on the slides um, as well, then it looks like we're good to go to talk a little bit about what's going to happen on June 10th and why are we so jazzed about it. So as part of the event that's happening on June 10th, or rather, let's let's actually just let the let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> on June 10th, we're going to see an annular eclipse. It is very specific to northern Canada for the large part. That's the that's the area of Canada that's going to be in the path of annularity. So they're going to see the best view of the annular eclipse. But that does not mean we're not going to see some pretty rad views in other regions of Canada. Um, as far west and north as, as Yukon and as well as far east as Newfoundland. So I saw some people calling in, logging in from New Brunswick um, and, other and some places in Ontario. We are going to see the eclipse, we're just not going to see the full eclipse and that is still totally fine because partial eclipses are rad too. Um, so we're going to get a little bit further into what is an annual annular eclipse and how is that different from what we've already talked about, as well as how to view it safely and some cool challenge things. So I wanted to let the cat out of the bag a little early because I think it's just rad that we have another eclipse happening so soon. But what have we done to make this more accessible, make the content more accessible and fun and interesting for you? Well, the first thing is that we have partnered with, um, we've been partnering with the uh, Canada France Hawaii Telescope or CFHT. And one of the folks that we're really happy to collaborate with a lot is Lori. And this is one of her videos on which is talking about Indigenous tales. And this particular video, as well as some other videos that um, she has done with, with us uh, for the eclipse specifically, it has available subtitles in a number of Indigenous languages. So if you are someone who lives in a community where one or multiple of these languages are used or spoken, please feel free to go check out the Vimeo for CFHT and find the video that works best for you and your community and your students. Um, or if you want to showcase a language that's spoken in a neighboring community, or something, whatever you want. Just go look at the videos, they're really rad, no matter what language you speak or use. Um, I think everyone can take something from the videos that Larry has posted. So let's talk about the annular solar eclipse. This is where we get into how is this different from a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse? And well, an annular eclipse is just shorthand for annular solar eclipse. So oh, it's not a third one. Thank goodness we don't have to worry about learning a third type of eclipse. The annular solar eclipse is, though, is, however, distinct from what we normally call a total solar eclipse. And this one is when the moon still passes between the Earth and the sun, uh, but the moon is further away from Earth than usual. So it casts a little bit different of a shadow. So this is how this would differ. So as the moon is orbiting, it's passing between us and the sun. We still have a partial eclipse that happens. But now we have a region of annular eclipse. And this does look a little different than the one we had before. We have a cross here. What does that mean? Well, if you remember our definition of the shadows, um, we talked about the penumbra and the umbra. The penumbra is still a thing here. The shadow gradient is still very much happening um, where we have the partial eclipse. But this is not the umbra. So this is our third type of shadow. There's three types of shadows. Um, Normally, when we talk about the solar eclipse, we talk about the umbra is where the path of totality is, and the penumbra is, the, is where the partial eclipse is. For annular eclipses, it's a little different. So because the moon is closer to the sun, further away from Earth in the annular eclipse case, this is actually not the umbra that's being cast on the Earth, but the ant umbra. And the ant umbra is purely defined as the fact that the eclipsing object or the, the um, object that is casting a shadow when it's passing in front of a light source is further away from the object it's casting a shadow on, which is exactly how we've just find an annular solar eclipse. So I'm not sure if you want to remember this um, in terms of the actual scientific definitions, or if you want to remember this by alliteration, annular and umbra. Um, but an annular solar eclipse is defined by its ant umbra, and both of them just mean the object that's casting the shadow is closer to the light source. And because it's closer to the light source, it appears to be inside of the light source. So there's a ring 
of the sun in this case that will be visible around the moon. And this is another way to remember it. Annular usually refers to annulus, which just means ring. If you, I think if you look up the definition, say on Google or on one of your favorite dictionary uh, sites, you'll actually find that annular and annulus can sometimes be translated to donut. And that's my favorite. So this is the donut eclipse, in my opinion, <laughs> and how I want to refer to it. So now we can kind of bring it down and say, okay, what are the different types of solar eclipse? We're muddying the waters here by saying it's not just lunar and solar. We have different kinds of solar eclipses that we also need to consider and think about. So we have our total eclipse, one that we're already pretty confident with, when the moon completely blocks out the sun and we only see the corona or the atmosphere. We have our annular eclipse, when the moon is in front of the sun but appears smaller than the sun and therefore a ring is visible around it. And a third type, which we only really mention as a third type because it's a consequence of either one of the prior two. Uh, but some regions, like for example, uh, where I live in Toronto, is only going to see a partial eclipse for June 10th. Um, so this is why we're including as a third type here, because it is sometimes the only one that you see in a particular region. And that's still totally fine. Eclipses of anything are rad. So a partial eclipse then is when the moon is not completely in front of the sun. So those are our three big types of solar eclipse and the three different kinds that you could see during an eclipse if you're in a region that's going to observe it. This particular annular eclipse, um, there's a really rad graphic that we, that we uh, worked with Astrolab to create. Path of annularity, as I showcased, is in Ontario sweeping up through northern Quebec and hitting a large part of Nunavut. So that's where that, those are the folks who are going to see that annular eclipse, that ring. Everyone else, depending on your region, will see a various kinds of partial eclipse. So the green region here is when you're pretty much seeing um, just about a full eclipse. You're so far north and close to the path of annularity that you're pretty much going to see an annular eclipse. It's just not quite uh, the sun, the moon being right in the center of the sun. As we get further and further south, the eclipse actually happens earlier and earlier in the morning for you. So, or rather not necessarily earlier because of the time zone, but earlier in terms of before sunrise. And if something is happening before sunrise, you're not gonna be able to see it, unfortunately. Uh, so those of us in this in this yellow and, or, and red bands, we do see some of the eclipse in, as a partial, but it's also limited by when is sunrise in your region. So now let's think about what are we, what would you actually see? So I think I see the chat going. I want to get through a couple more slides before I before I answer questions again, but I have a feeling some of it might be about what are we going to see. So if you are in the path of annularity, which is this blue region here, what you can expect to see is the following: the sun before the eclipse, and then the moon passing in front of it slowly. As the moon goes into the sun and the ring starts to form, that's the beginning of the maximum. The actual maximum is when the moon is directly centered in front of the sun. And then you're going to have it ending, the moon is moving away from the sun, and the eclipse ends. So this is, I should also mention, this is a view through a solar filter. Uh, you never want to look at the sun directly, and we're going to talk a little bit more about safety in this moment. So if you are not in the path of annularity, which is me and probably a lot of, a lot of you in the audience as well, you're going to see before the eclipse, the beginning of the eclipse, and your maximum is going to be a partial eclipse. And then the moon will continue moving. And then you have the sun not, not being eclipsed anymore. So this is what you can expect to see depending on where you are. Um, and of course, I just want to point out some of this before the eclipse and beginning of the eclipse might be before sunrise for you, depending on how far south you are. And if that's the case, then when you start viewing at sunrise, you might start by seeing the maximum of the eclipse. And I don't know what that's going to look like. You're, you know, waiting with your projection or your, or your glasses for the sun to come up. And as soon as it comes up, it's 70 or 80 or 50% covered um, by the moon. So that's super exciting. I think that's a really interesting part of this eclipse is also the fact that it's happening in the morning. Less of it to see, unfortunately, but I think it's going to be a cool visual. So to find out when 
your, when the partial eclipse or full eclipse is happening in your region, we've linked a few different sites here for you to go check out. Um, time and date is pretty good at not only having all of the dates correct for your for a specific region or community, it's also searchable and uh, it will present the times in your local time zone. So you don't so you don't really have to worry about it telling you a time in a different time zone and therefore you get up an hour too late or you get up an hour too early um, or something like that. So time and date is a really good one. Um, also the Planetarium in Montreal has lists already curated on their website. I totally recommend for you to go check that out as well. And there are other resources. One of them is this last one from eclipse2024.org. But as I mentioned, those are your where these are where these are some of the places you can check out to find when your when to actually view the eclipse in your area and when the maximum is, when it's going to start, when it's going to end, so that you can kind of plan your morning accordingly. But when you are planning, just make sure that you are keeping in mind that you should never, ever, ever observe the sun directly with the naked eye. Um, this is really, really damaging, even during an eclipse, especially during an annual or eclipse where not all of the sun is blocked out. Uh, it will likely damage your vision and it can cause blindness and it can cause other severe injuries in and around the eye. So please do not observe the sun directly with the naked eye. Uh, please use um, eye protective equipment that is rated for solar viewing, such as solar filters, or our uh, eclipse viewers that we had made for the for this eclipse in particular. We are all out of these uh, right now. All of our kits have already been spoken for, unfortunately. But there are other ways to get so to get glasses if you really want them. Just even if you can't get glasses, don't use sunglasses. <laughs> I think that's the the biggest one. Um, so never just say that, oh, you know, these sunglasses are really dark and then you look at the sun with them. Don't do that. <laughs> sunglasses are not cleared to view the sun directly. Um, only, only eclipse glasses um, or other similarly highly rated uh, prote eye protective equipment such as welding goggles and things like that could potentially be okay. But certainly if you're unsure, check with the manufacturer um, and that would be your best way to, that would be the best way to know. Never guess if something's good enough, unless you're explicitly told that yes, it is good enough by someone who works for that company or who's been, has a part in making them in the first place. So I already mentioned that we did have Eclipse viewers um, that we sent out with Eclipse kits to folks in the path of annularity, as well as very, very far north. Um, but what happens if you don't have Eclipse viewers or Eclipse glasses? Because again, we don't have any more of these, unfortunately. Um, we sold out real fast. So, what do we do in that case? How do we still view the eclipse and have fun with it if you don't have eclipse viewers or eclipse glasses? Well, another reason is another another thing you could do is the eclipse challenge. So we are asking for folks to participate in the eclipse challenge, especially if you don't have eclipse viewers, um, because we think that this is going to be a fun way to get people involved and still active with the eclipse and also allow you to view it. So this is an indirect viewing where we're asking folks to get creative with projection techniques. And all you need for projection is a small hole or a, or a series of small holes that you face towards your light source, in this case, the sun, and project onto a sheet. So what's happening in this set of photos is that this is a sheet of paper that says Eclipse 2017 with holes poked in it. It looks like they weren't hole punched. It looks like it was kind of jabbed with a pencil. So you don't have to be high tech <laughs> to do the projection technique. And they're just projecting it right onto another piece of white paper. So these are holes. But what we're seeing here are actual little projections, little images of the eclipse that happened in August of 2017. So this is a relatively simple form of projection. And what we're asking for people to do with the Eclipse Challenge is to get more creative. Um, you can totally do something like this and create a keepsake. That's 100% amazing. But feel free if you have time and the resources to make some art designs, uh, create other projection materials and test them out and see which one works best for you and how and which one you maybe you wanna keep as a souvenir. Cool. And so just to also point out, even if you don't have a sheet of paper, if you have a spatula or a colander or a strainer that has holes in it, uh, you can project using that, <laughs> which is super awesome and, and great. So no matter what you have lying around, whether you prepared beforehand or you didn't, 
uh, you should, everyone can participate in the challenge and everyone can use the projection technique to view the eclipse on June 10th. Uh, so these photos are um, our CEO, Julie, <laughs> on the left here. And she has a grater and they are holding the grater uh, over a sheet of paper to create the projection. So that was, that was also during the August uh, uh, 2017 eclipse. So now before I start getting into the end of the presentation here and talking about upcoming solar eclipses, um, I'm just gonna leave up the challenge for a moment. I'm gonna check the chat and see if we have questions. Whoop, keep clicking the presentation instead. Let me look at the chat. See, it went bananas. And I annotated, of course I did. All right. Uh, Sorry, I have to scroll up and look. Sorry to interrupt, CJ, do you want me to tell you the main question we have there? Oh, sure, yeah, sorry, I've been scrolling through the chat. Yeah, there's actually, there's some activity because I've been putting links, but the main question is from KHO a bit above and it asked, it asked about like, besides for the eyes to observe the solar eclipse or lunar eclipse, is there any data available for high school students to explore, to investigate with the sun and the moon in a level more uh, in depth in the level for more in-depth understanding of the universe and follow-up questions was sort of, can we use some sort of collected data to calculate the radius of the sun, moon, the distance apart? Question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It, the more question marks, the more uh, inquisitive the question. <laughs> um, okay, so I think for the first one, uh, this is slightly different in my, in my view. There are way, there are, um, I would say this, there are data sets and there are simulations to investigate the Earth and Sun system more intensely, as well as the cosmos more intensely. Um, to view Eclipse specifically, I think it kind of depends on what kind of data you want. Like, are you really looking, I know the second question was about the, the numbers, that juicy, juicy data. But if you're looking for more, um, you know, fine-tuned resolution on if I set at this date, at this time, and I can watch the eclipse happen, I think Stellarium would be a really good one. There's a number of workshops that DU does for Stellarium. Um, and again, I can also put, the, put those resources directly in the slides afterwards. Stellarium would be one way to investigate it a little more finely, as well as looking at how other um, celestial bodies move. I think that one's really useful. But if the question was more so about how do we get data to calculate, uh, I will say that we had made really significant, intense and in-depth educational content for the education kits for the Eclipse project where we sent out all of these Eclipse classes at the same time. And that, even though the Eclipse classes are no longer available, the educational content is posted publicly on our website. So uh, not on this post specifically, but on, um, it's at the bottom in the resources. I don't think I have it, yeah, all okay. right. So when we get down there, uh, that's posted in the resources, the actual page that we made for the 2021 eclipse as a total. Those educational resources have um, suggested activities on how do you get higher level students. So say like a grade 12 physics class, um, which is kind of where my background is, by the way, I didn't mention it, but I do have a PhD in physics and I've taught high school math and science. So for your grade 11 or your grade 12 uh, physics classes, we have some activities in the educational material on the website for the June 10th, um, 2021 eclipse that could fill those roles that you want. If for the second question, if, and again, maybe the first question intended that too, if you're looking for data like logs of data or like spreadsheets or um, text files that you can download or things like that, where it's something along the lines of how far away is the moon at this particular moment and is it measured as well as radiuses of the of the earth and the sun. I'm not sure off the top of my head where you would find that, but again, that can definitely be something if you comment that question on the slides, I'm gonna be able to go back and do some more research on it and answer your question at a later time. But right now, I, I can't think of anything that would have logs of data like that. Um, I hope that answers your questions, but again, remember that if I'm not answering your questions fully, I'm really, really happy to answer them on the Google Slides directly as, as I get more time to research and think about it. I certainly don't know everything and I won't remember everything as we go through the webinar right away.
Oh, and then there was also a couple of questions about more resources for showcasing uh, eclipses and demonstrating them. So we do know of a couple of places where you can demonstrate um, eclipses, lunar and solar eclipses pretty nicely. So definitely, again, those would be comments that will go right on the slides and I can answer them um, or I can give you those links directly in there and add them to the resources page and things like that. Okay, so if I think for now, in the sake of time, I'd just like to highlight some of the upcoming solar eclipses. So even though we have the eclipse challenge for June 10th, there are other eclipse, solar eclipses that are happening really soon. And I think that's, or there's upcoming eclipses in general that are happening. So big one, June 10th, 2021, it's an annual solar eclipse. We have the eclipse challenge for it. We have education materials for it. Um, we sent like there, it was a big project that DU worked on and we're also telling you about it right now. So I hope that the two-ish, three-ish weeks between now and June 10th is enough time for you to think about what you might want to do for it. And certainly please um, uh, engage in the challenge. We'd love to see what you're planning to do for projection or how you're planning to view the sun. Pinhole cameras, of course, are also a good option. Uh, there's going to be another annular solar eclipse in October of 2023, a total solar eclipse on, in April of 2024, a partial solar eclipse people in Canada in 2025, and Again, a total solar eclipse, but partial in Canada in 2026. So the big one, that the big two big ones that I would say you really want to focus on uh, or burn into your memory or put it in your Google calendar <laughs> is the one on June 10th. And then there's a, and then the big total solar eclipse is going to pass um, right through parts of Canada on April 8th of 2024. We're already starting to plan for that one. So expect big things to come, but certainly keep that date in mind. And lastly is our resources. So this is some of the links that Julie's been sending, but this is all of them together. So hopefully you're gonna be able to find everything you need. I can always add more later as well. Um, so there's the main page, which is discovertheuniverse.ca slash eclipse 2021. Also, if you just go to eclipse2021.ca, uh, that will bring you to that page. We, may, we wanted to be ready for internet traffic. Um, we also have our post that explains the challenge, the Facebook event for the challenge where all of the stuff is going to be, and we made a fun YouTube video in both English and French. Everything here, of course, is bilingual um, for the introduction of the eclipse, as well as some visual demonstrations of projection techniques. And I'm also going to invite that if you have questions specifically about what we talked about in the webinar, um, please do leave them in the Google Slides or send them in the chat now if we have time to answer them before the end. But if you have longer questions or um, you, I don't know, you feel like the comments in Google Slides are not sufficient, whatever, whatever floats your boat, please feel free to uh, contact me by email at charles at discovertheuniverse.ca. I'm very, very happy to answer your questions and talk to you about uh, the eclipse on June 10th. And other than that, I'm gonna say the rest of the time might be open to questions for five minutes until until five o'clock my time. Um, but even if you don't want to contact us about the eclipse, you have other questions, uh, concerns, feedback, please do feel free to email us at info at discovertheuniverse.ca. Check us out on all our social media platforms, um, as well as on our website for more cool training. So thank you so much for you know, attending the webinar. Uh, thank you for asking great questions. Thank you for engaging. And I'm really happy to answer any questions people have now in the last few minutes, if there are any. All right, one of the questions I see earlier on, sorry, I'm scrolling back through the chat, <laughs> is um, uh, one is about curvature of the shadow. Can we estimate the real radius of the sun, of the moon slash the sun? From the curvature of the shadow. I think I'm gonna need to think about that one a little bit before I give a yes or no answer. Um, I think what this question is asking, because again, it's, well, you wanna clarify, uh, what we mean by curvature of the shadow. I'm assuming what this means is curvature of the shadow in the way that when it's projected onto the earth, it is in like a, a spherical, sorry, circular shape. Um, so if you could calculate the curvature of the circle, could you then estimate the radius of the sun and the moon? I think off the top of my head, I need to check out into this, but I think you would also need the distance um, between the earth and the moon. And also keep in mind that the moon's shadow is being cast onto a curved surface because the earth is also a sphere. 
Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure. I think you need a couple more pieces of information, but that's a really good question from KHO. I just probably gonna put my real serious physics hat on and think about that more. And then I see a lot of questions for links, uh, which is amazing. Oh, and then from KHO again, as I scroll up, uh, is Toronto in the boundary of the yellow and the pink region as shown in the slide? So I'm actually gonna go back to that slide where we showed, this is where I regret my animations. Uh, oh, there it is, oh God, okay. So the, uh, where this is, so I just wanna also highlight that while this is a fantastic image that has a lot of information, um, from that Astrolab made and it was a ton of work. The lines here, as you can see, because we're zoomed out and looking at you know half of the continent of North America, um, it's not gonna, it's unclear exactly where certain cities are. So I can tell you that for Toronto specifically, we are able to view it slightly after sunrise. So we would be in the yellow region. We would be in the yellow region on this map here, which is when um, sunrise is before the eclipse gets to our version of maximum as a, par as a partial. And uh, so we are in the yellow region here. I hope that addresses it. But yeah, no, so it's, it is hard to tell on the map because we don't have little icons. Um, but yes, Toronto is in this yellow region. So is Montreal and Ottawa, of course. And I'm not sure if Hamilton is actually even thinking about cities that are close to Toronto. I'm not sure if Hamilton's in the yellow region, but it might be. Okay, and if there's, I don't want to scroll back too far because I know that uh, we had questions earlier that I also answered, but I just want to say thank you again for coming to the webinar. I hope that it was helpful. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, do give us feedback on if you like the way that we're sharing information, we liked it, if you liked it through Google Slides or not, as well, if you think of other questions that you'd like, or there's specific resources that I didn't address uh, that you'd like to see, just put that comment right on the Google Slides, and I can always answer it um, after the webinar. I'm very happy to do that.